Bryce Norton, Britain's largest military airbase. 8,000 men and women serve and live in a thriving community the size of a small town. It operates 24 hours a day with seven flying squadrons, two parachute units, Our race going now. a world-class aeromedical evacuation unit, this is our number one priority, get this guy home, and an airport that dispatches and receives thousands of troops back home from war zones. I'm so excited, I want to cry. The most seasoned professionals rub shoulders with the newest recruits. Train hard, fight easy. Done correctly, it's a work of art. But it's more than just a military base. Supporting operations in Afghanistan, hosting traditional historic celebrations, to the saddest of all occasions. Everything stops for the repatriation to take effect. Inside RAF Bryce Norton. In this episode, a flight crew prepared to deliver a helicopter to Camp Bastion in Afghanistan. There could be surface-to-air missiles and rocket-propelled grenades as well. An emergency on board a Hercules aircraft as a load gets jammed. He kind of started running around a bit like you're not supposed to, and I was like, OK, something's not right. And a medical team is scrambled to airlift a highly infectious patient to a specialist hospital. The journey by road exposed the people, bringing the patient back to some risk of acquiring the infection from the patient. RAF Bryce Norton is the biggest and busiest military airbase in the UK. The runway here is the major hub for sending troops and critical cargo to support military operations all over the world. Every year, Bryce Norton handles an average of 250,000 personnel movements and a huge variety of hardware and supplies out to the war in Afghanistan, over 3,000 miles away. This Chinook helicopter is due to be dispatched to Camp Bastion. Chinooks are vital for aeromedical evacuations and airlifting troops and equipment around the inhospitable terrain of the wild Afghan landscape. It's a battlefield helicopter. It's able to operate in areas where you're not going to be able to get other aircraft in, and it can carry loads that no other helicopter can, going out, scooping people up and getting them back to hospitals as quick as possible. It's essential to operate and essential to looking after our people. The team at RAF Odium in Hampshire are preparing the helicopter for transport to Afghanistan via Bryce Norton. The aircraft breakdown is approximately a five-day process, including its transport to Bryce Norton. Uh, the reason we do it is to get it to fit onto the C-17. It includes taking the blades off, forward and aft heads, transmissions, etc., uh, to be able to make it to fit. And once it's landed in Camp Bastion, this Chinook will be reassembled and start the serious business of saving lives. It's just after dawn at Bryce Norton, and a C-17, the monster of all cargo planes, receives the Chinook into its hold. Flown by 99 Squadron, the eight-strong fleet can each haul up to 45 tonnes of outsized cargo. Pilot Annabelle Bacon is flying the C-17 with the Chinook on board on the first part of a two-stage journey to Camp Bastion in Afghanistan. Every time I pitch up at the aircraft, there's a different load, um, different requirements um, for taking freight or people um, or anything really around the world. So, uh, sort of unusual as usual. It's a seven hour flight to the Middle East, and Annabelle and her co pilot have a lot to focus on. During the flight, obviously, the two pilots um, at the front of the aircraft will be. Uh, monitoring the radio, talking to traffic control, um, weather avoiding sometimes, uh, deciding what height we'd rather fly at. And then line of is complete. Meanwhile, the ground engineers responsible for the maintenance of the aircraft grab some sleep in the back. So the ground engineer, their job is to service the aircraft, refuel the aircraft, fix the aircraft should anything go wrong and it breaks. Um, so actually they are trying to get the rest in flight. 
so that they can be better placed to service the aircraft when we land. And when we land, we sort of hand the aircraft over to the engineers and say, there you go, your turn. <laughs> For many pilots, the pleasure of flying the C-17 is the combination of its sheer size and capabilities. It's designed for outsized cargo, so we can take anything like helicopters and uh, tanks and vehicles, pretty much anything really that you can think about. What I love about it is, well, it's new for starters, so that's always nice to fly something that's, that's um, got a great future ahead of it. As the day ends, Annabelle's stage of the flight draws to a close. There's a beautiful sunset out of the window, and um, it's never, ever a boring sight. Uh, every sunset's always different, different cloud formations, um, different cities below them. You can't always see the ground um, below the cloud, obviously. Um, but yeah, they look pretty good. It's a really nice sight, and um, it's definitely one thing you do think, wow, I'm pretty privileged to have this job to... Speed jumps and get out. After seven hours in the air, Annabelle's flying time is up. A fresh crew is waiting on the ground to continue the journey. Ground spoilers. Now we landed um, at our operating destination out in the Middle East, and the other crew have arrived at the aircraft to um, start doing their checks, check the routing and all the timing for the next bit of uh, flying into Afghanistan. And we'll just um, head off to the accommodation and get a little bit of much earned sleep. Taking over the controls from Annabelle Bacon is Flight Lieutenant John Le Cornu. His leg of transporting the Chinook to Camp Bastion is far more of a challenge. Once they cross the border into Afghanistan, the crew adjusts to entering a war zone and the threat of enemy fire. Small arms fire. It could be an organised small arms fire or it could be just some uh, random uh, Taliban uh, member trying to have a pot shot at us. Um, there could be other threats such as uh, surface-to-air missiles um, and rocket propelled grenades as well. Looking after it and unloading it in Camp Bastion is the job of Loadmaster Jonathan Owen Williams. The flight from uh, here to Bastion is about two hours and 15 minutes, which isn't long all in all. When we're getting near to the border, um, we'll have a brief and we'll do some combat entry drills, uh, which is just to get the aircraft ready to go into theatre. There's a number of things that we can do to be tactical going into places like Bastion and Afghanistan. Um, one example is we need to make sure the cockpit is completely armoured, so we'll take the cushions off the seats, we'll put uh, bulletproof armour on the seats to protect uh, the crew. Uh, we'll also put body armour on as well. First time I put body armour going into um, a theatre of operations, um, it, it did feel rather strange. I'd just come out of training and suddenly that made me realise this is what I've joined for. It is uncomfortable when you're trying to fly. It's like um, trying to put, wearing a, a small rucksack whilst driving your car. And also, we have a member of each crew constantly looking out down and behind us for any signs of shots being fired at the aircraft, etc. Also, before we start descending, the lights have to go um, over, uh, covert, so we'll switch to uh, red lighting and put that down fairly, fairly low, so that obviously the aircraft is flat from outside. One of the big dangers, apart from the ground, trying to come down quickly, is not being able to see. So we do actually use night vision goggles. They make sure that, uh, we're all, that uh, everyone is ready for any sort of eventuality that might happen. Uh, but really, it is the, the heightened sort of sensors as you go in, just trying to make sure that we, we stay safe. With all the precautions taken and the descent about to begin, John and his team are ready for any emergency. Really, it's a, a very quick dive from altitude down to the airfield. You are having to work just a little bit harder to actually make sure that everyone, uh, the aircraft and you, and whichever precious cargo you're taking actually remain safe as you go in. So, uh, Get the heart rate going a little bit more. After a safe and bumpy bastion landing, 
the Chinook is safely on the ground in Afghanistan. Within days, it will be reassembled and ready to offer life-saving support for troops on the ground. It's the end of a testing flight for the C-17 of 99 Squadron, and it's this kind of adrenaline on flying into a war zone that pilots like Le Cornu have signed up for. It does stretch you as a crew. Um, you have to think more carefully about what you're doing. And really, one of the reasons you join the military is to stretch yourself and maybe put yourself into a, a, a little bit more danger than normal. RAF Bryce Norton is Britain's busiest military airbase. Each year, thousands of troops and millions of tons of supplies are flown out to the front line. And whenever someone is badly injured in action, the Aeromedical Evacuation Service, based at Bryce Norton, will come to the rescue and bring them back home. We're the military's air ambulance service. We will deal with some of the most severely ill people within the military or seriously injured. Within 24 hours of their injury, we've scrambled a team, which is effectively a mobile intensive care department. The aeromedical team are on call 24-7. It's 5 a.m. on a cold November morning, and they're heading out to Cyprus on a TriStar to collect patients who've been sent back from the front line in Afghanistan. As well as returning soldiers with varying degrees of physical injuries, the RAF also brings home personnel who've suffered other kinds of damage from being exposed to a war. Psychiatric nurse Sean Lynch takes care of patients whose injuries are not physical, but mental. Uh, the patient I'm picking up today, one's uh, an adjustment reaction, and another one is suffering from a post-traumatic stress reaction. A lot of the things that the guys see in tell is from theatre, you know, and they're not equipped to deal with it. They're getting exposed to traumas day in, day out, and it's, it builds up over a period of time. And then eventually, it's like a champagne bottle. You shake it, the cork will pop. The aeromedical team at Bryce Norton make an average of three flights a week. The team grab as much sleep as they can as they know the return flight caring for their patients will be very hands-on. Soon they'll land in Cyprus and head off to meet their new patients. 40, 30. 20, 10. At the airport in Cyprus, the team improvise an outdoor workspace. It's my office. Patients have arrived in from Bastion. Uh, we're just getting a handover now to see what the clinical update is with them, attend to any clinical needs that need addressing. Patient Alpha, uh -huh. he's doing OK. There's right. really minimal risk and he's really just keen to get home. He's aware of what's happening, he's aware right. you're taking him on moving them forward, Great. and he's just really keen to have his support from his family. Soldiers' physical injuries are well known to the public, but much less familiar are other types of damage war can cause. I think in theatre, a lot of things can trigger certain emotions, and quite acute stress reactions can take place. And when people are away from the environment, away from the people they trust to manage how they usually feel, without those usual support networks, it can sometimes be quite difficult for them to cope. Both for the person experiencing a breakdown and the morale of fellow troops, it's important to get the patient away from the front line. The aim is to get all casualties back home as quickly as possible. With regards to the psychiatry itself and mental health provision, um, we seem to be shaking off the, the stigma that's always been associated with it. So now the guys are more willing to come forward and seek help. Uh, it's not viewed as a weakness anymore. Basically our primary goal is just to get them back again to the UK. Uh, so basically what we have to look at is keeping them calm, keeping them in a safe environment, making sure that there is nothing else going to interfere with them. Um, and then just tell them they've got a sleep-deprived 16 stone, here they are Scots been looking after them, and they tend to behave themselves. <laughs>
we try to encourage sleep. Sleep's a great healer for these guys, you know. Um, when they're out in the forward operating bases and on the camp, the sleep pattern is somewhat disrupted. You can't really get your good eight hours, you know. There's always something going on. Get it down! They're seeing multiple traumas. They're seeing their, their mates being killed. You know, guys that they're laughing and joking with one minute, next minute, he's no longer there. They're getting hit with IEDs. You know, when you think about it, some of these guys are 18, 19 years of age. You know, I mean, they've come out of school, they went through their basic training, but nothing can prepare you for what actually happens out there. We do get a lot of guys who have suffered blast injuries, you know. The first one I saw shook me to the core. There's a guy with lower abdominal injury and both his legs missing. And I think what hurt me more was the fact that he he'd lost his genitals as well. 50, 40, 30, 30 20, 20, 20, 10. The most satisfying bit about this job is getting them home safely back to where they want to be. On touching down, patients are desperate to make contact with their loved ones. We let them make that phone call, and it gives them peace of mind, it gives the family peace of mind, knowing that they're back in the UK, because that makes a big difference, you know, as opposed to being 5,000 miles away. When they're back in the UK, you're within touching distance, and it, that picks up the mental health side of things, you know, that gives them a hell of a boost. RAF Bryce Norton flies everything from wounded soldiers, thousands of troops, and over 31 million kilos of supplies and equipment around the world. Based just off the main runway is number one air mobility wing. These are the people who load and unload whatever's on board. Today, they're in training, unloading the contents of a Hercules transport aircraft on the runway in Bryce Norton, under the watchful eye of Sergeant Mick Edmonds. But in a couple of weeks, they'll be doing it for real at Camp Bastion in Afghanistan. One of our main priorities in Camp Bastion is to offload and unload aircraft while the engines are running. The reason is to save time and also, in theatre, if the engines had to stop and they couldn't be restarted, we would then lose the asset of that aircraft. This is the sort of operation we perform in any scenario, from day and night. Mick and his team will be doing a three-month tour of Afghanistan. And like so many servicemen and women, he'll be leaving his family behind. What? Nicole does struggle because she's a daddy's girl. And we do have lots of tears. And we make lots of things special for her, like she's got a doll with her dad's face on. And we have lots of special days out and we have to treat her with a kid gloves splatter. Mick's teenage daughter, Chloe, has got used to her dad being away from home. If he's gone for like a couple of days, I don't really mind. I just get on with things. But if it's you, he's gone a long way, I do normally. Chloe's very grown up for a, for a nearly a teenager. Um, she's very sensible. Uh, she does miss me when I go away. However, she also knows that she has to be more grown up about it. She helps with the cooking. She helps with the cleaning. Uh, we've not quite trained her to do the ironing yet. <laughs> But uh, that will come in time. Oh, and I mean, there's on the map. Can you remember where Daddy's going on the map? Um, I think it's around here. Around there somewhere. <laughs> it's not far, really, is it? <laughs> it's Mick's first time in Afghanistan, and the realities of being in a war zone are worrying for his family. They do um, ask questions now, especially with the repats coming back to Bryz. We do get more questions and um, the news because it's on all the time. But um, we do tend to cross over. Or oh, someone else on the news has died. We're like, yeah, that's fine. It's not one of Daddy's. Back at Bryce Norton, on the airfield, one AMW's training exercise is coming to an end. The next time they'll be doing this will be three and a half thousand miles away in Afghanistan. Next, an emergency on a Hercules aircraft when a load jams. If it had suddenly freed up and gone out of the aircraft, we'd have been way off the drop zone and we could have been over Tidworth over a main road. 
an urgent mission for the aeromedical team as a critically ill patient is airlifted to specialist care. He has an infectious disease that is deemed to be a risk to himself and possibly a public health risk. Bryce Norton is the hub of Britain's military air deployment, both at home and overseas. And one of the key roles it plays is sending supplies and equipment to troops all over the world. Specialist Army Unit 47 Air Dispatch Squadron of the Royal Logistic Corps has been based at Bryce Norton since 2011. They're the delivery boys of the British military dropping vital supplies and equipment anywhere in the world by aircraft or helicopter. 47 Air Dispatch Squadron can make a life-changing difference on, on operations. That is, uh, especially in, in Afghanistan, where we, we operate uh, continually for the last 10 years. If you are in dire straits and you need something right now uh, and you can't get it by vehicle, then we enjoy the pressure of working under those type of conditions. This particular container is probably about one tonne's worth of ammunition that can be parachuted from there. Now, the real benefit from parachuting one tonne of ammunition, it means a soldier in operations doesn't have to get into um, his vehicle and drive that ammuni ammunition to resupply somewhere. So we're hopefully saving the lives uh, of, of troops on the ground. Airdrop supplies are a critical lifeline to isolated forward operating bases, or FOBs. You'll have your main base, like Cambastin or uh, Kandahar, and then you'll have your, your other fobs that are branched out from them. They're basically um, ways of holding the ground. They're not, very, they're not very luxurious sandbag walls or an old compound, so the lads in there are on bare minimums, so everything, everything they can get their hands on is good for them. In a war zone like Afghanistan, the accuracy of a drop is even more critical. The last thing you want to do is resupply the Taliban <laughs> with fresh ammunition and water for them to fight our troops with. So it's, it's number one priority that we get it in the right spot. We can fly in safely away from all the IEDs, all the roadside bombs, suicide bombers, at a, a safe height. We'll swoop down, do the airdrop, and get straight back up, out of the way. But being in the air doesn't stop them from being a target. We've had close calls, we've had engine fires and been shot at, small arms fire, and you can have RPGs fired at you. A lot of the time, because you're in the back of the aircraft, you can't see, you know, you're, you're contained inside it. So ignorance is bliss, really. It's only when you get back and you realise that people have been shooting or, you know, they land and say, quick, get off, engine's on fire, you know, things like that, that gets your heart going. Intensive training takes place at Bryce Norton. Yeah, yeah. pull it on then. Practice um, a lot of low level flying. We'll practice a lot of airdrops to make sure that things don't go wrong on operations. Every exercise begins with a safety briefing, despite the noisy intrusions from outside. That's why when we all fail our hearing tests, <laughs> that's why, because we live on the runway. <laughs> After three hours of low-level flying, the team reached their designated drop zone near Tidworth in Wiltshire. When you're blasting round in the plane and the back door's open, there's always a chance you could miss your footing on something and, and stumble out the back. But that's what, obviously why we wear the harnesses to stop us uh, hitting the ground. When we go off the back of the ramp, um, it's, quite, it's quite scary because you're right up at the edge and you've got the wind coming into the side. Um, yeah, I'm quite scared of heights and flying, so it's a bit of a challenge, but it's very exciting at the same time. As the pilots signal their approach in the drop zone, it's time for Steve to make the call. The first three crates dispatched correctly, but there's a problem with the fourth. 
Suddenly, the crew are dealing with a totally unexpected situation known as a load emergency. Becky Lane can see from watching Steve that something's gone very wrong. He kind of started running around a bit like you're not supposed to, and I was like, okay, something's not right. So he put the chocks in and we put this chain on. It's an urgent scramble to lock down the load and prevent it going out the back, as the aircraft is now speeding away from the safety of the drop zone. We had a jam blow. I've never seen it happen before. It's never happened to me. As the crew commander, you always want everything to go out the back. And that, time, that one time it didn't, so... It could have been dangerous if it had stopped right on the edge of the ramp and the weight of the load would have been on the back end of the aircraft. Luckily for us, he stopped in the middle, in the centre of the aircraft. Because if it had suddenly freed up and gone out of the aircraft, we'd have been way off the drop zone and we could have been over Tidworth or somewhere like that. What only seems like a few seconds in the air could potentially be a, a couple of miles. Unexpected equipment failure shows just how valuable training can be. Obviously, you always talk about it happening, but it hasn't happened in so long, you don't really expect it to. And then you have to react quite quickly and know what to do. And it was good to have that experience now, so if it happens again, I know what I'm doing. It makes me feel good, to be honest, that, that we've got a, a job to do and we can do it to the best of our ability. Because every job, every job within the military has its own part, it's all... It's all a different cog in a big machine. RAF Bryce Norton doesn't just transport military hardware and troops around the world. If there is a medical emergency involving British civilians here in the UK or abroad, which requires an aircraft, Bryce Norton will respond. A man is critically ill in hospital with Britain's first case of the potentially fatal disease, Crimean Congo viral hemorrhagic fever. It's extremely rare in Western Europe. At the moment, his condition is critical. In the Brownlee Centre behind me, this is the Infectious Diseases Centre at Gart Naval Hospital in Glasgow. The patient needs to be flown urgently from Glasgow to a specialist hospital for infectious diseases in London. And a team from Bryce's aeromedical unit has been dispatched. For this patient that we're collecting tonight, he has an infectious disease that is deemed to be a risk to himself, and possibly a public health risk, and therefore we've been activated to collect. They're taking an isolation unit for the patient to prevent the risk of spreading the deadly virus. This is the uh, transportable isolator that can move patients with a highly infectious disease in isolation. Once a patient is loaded into this, we can secure them and create an isolation field. Keep on pushing around, pull around. This is a team of highly trained medical professionals working with a device that essentially allows them to transfer a patient but without spreading the infection risk around. This piece of kit is only ever used once every five or six years. It's quite a rare mission to recover patients suffering with a highly infectious diseases. And so yes, in terms of our call out, we're not activated too many times. When the call originally came through, you could say there's a degree of trepidation. Um, the fact that it is required is, is not normal and it's not routine. He has just six hours to assemble his team at Bryce. It was my role to try and arrange the team, get the team here, start to prepare the kit and equipment. Have we got transportation? Do we have team support? Do we have ambulance trust support? Logistically, can we move? The equipment's ready to go now. Team all ready to go. The jumbulance just arrived now to load the air transportable isolator onto it. And we'll take the jumbulance equipment and all the team loaded onto the aircraft. <laughs> the jumbulance is a supersized ambulance capable of carrying large numbers of patients as well as bulky medical equipment. It's the quickest and safest way of getting the isolation unit to the Hercules waiting on the runway. <laughs> Less than an hour after the call came in, the Hercules is packed and ready to go. This is the only way we could safely transport the patient because the journey by road would take a very long time and would also expose the people who were bringing the patient back in the ambulance to some risk of acquiring the infection from the patient. 
the facility that the RAF and Bryce Norton provide is invaluable for moving these patients. There's just no other way to do it. And they're a very, very highly trained and highly skilled group of people. And without them, our function as a, a unit in the middle of London would be greatly diminished. What was going through my mind is still that trepidation. Will the equipment work? Will this run smoothly? Can we ensure that there's no risks felt to anybody undertaking this mission and process uh, until that eventual arrival at the Royal Free, whenever the next day? The transfer of the patient from Glasgow to London was successful, but tragically, the patient died in hospital. At RAF Bryce Norton, the biggest aircraft on the runway is the C-17 Globemaster. It can carry monster loads of cargo over long distances, and today, its capabilities and the people loading it are being put to the test. They've got to get a helicopter the height of a bungalow and the weight of two double-decker buses on board and off to Afghanistan. Out on the front line, this Merling will transport up to 45 combat troops at a time and resupply bases with vital weapons and equipment. Merlin's probably one of the most difficult loads we do. The first time you ever see it out the back, you're thinking, crikey, that is going to be quite tight. John is supervising recently qualified Craig Harvey, who's been put in charge of the loading. This is going to be about a 14-hour day. So anything goes wrong, we've got the potential to uh, cause quite an upset. But almost immediately, there's a big problem. The opening ramp has stuck. One of the prop sensors. Um, it doesn't work. So do you reckon just the proc sensor's not talking to the ADSC? Part of the ramp system's not working, uh, and as a result, we can't get the helicopter on uh, because we can't get a continuous surface all the way down to the floor to winch the helicopter up. That's what you need at this time of the morning. The pressure is on Craig, as the C-17 must leave Bryce Norton on time. It has to reach Afghanistan under the cover of darkness to avoid the threat of being shot at in daylight. This has caused uh, a half hour to three quarter an hour delay. So when you're on a tight time schedule anyway, any delays now will add extra pressure to ourselves. At last, there's a breakthrough. That appears to be working. Yeah. We'll keep going and see if it happens again. Yeah. They're working? Yeah, you to go. Awesome. Now the ramp is fixed, Craig can focus on the task in hand loading the massive Merling helicopter on board. Um, anyone sees any problems whatsoever, okay, even if it's you know, tiny enough, it's important, big shot, stop. At 74 feet, nearly half the length of an Olympic swimming pool, it has to be broken down to fit inside. And first on is the tail section. Brakes are on. Loadmasters work long and very antisocial hours, but it's the variety and importance of their tasks that motivate them. The motivation probably for most of the squadron is the fact that you know you are supporting the front line troops. Um, our squadron also does the repatriation of guys back, so you know you get to see firsthand um, the cost of it. Uh, and as such, I think that does motivate people to, to try the very hardest to get the kit to theatre to support the guys out there so that we don't see too many of the repatriations. Uh, we've got various people positioned around the aircraft, um, one on top and several around the sides, just to make sure that the uh, clearances are sufficient for the aircraft, that it's not going to strike. With just a three centimetre gap at the top and a 50 centimetre gap either side to get it through the door, Craig's got his work cut out for him. Okay, winch it in. But the crew now need to pull it as far into the cargo hold as they can. The three centimetre gap seems tighter than ever. Nice and slow, Craig. Nice and slow, mate. Nearly there. Out of there. Out of How there. much more have you got to go? Oh. Brakes on, chucks in. With the helicopter safely on board, John's pleased with Craig's performance. Um, he's not damaged either aircraft, which is excellent news. And, uh, yeah, not really many points to teach him, and uh, everything's gone very well, so very pleased with the way the day's gone. 
But Craig's day isn't over yet. He now has a seven-hour flight to the Middle East, where another loader will step in to take this crucial delivery to its final destination, Camp Bastion. Another outpost served by the C-17 is the Mount Pleasant base in the Falkland Islands, a 19-hour flight away. Reported tensions between Argentina and the UK indicate that shipping embargoes have hit the remote islands, resulting in a shortage of today's cargo, eggs. But there's a technical issue with the aircraft. Uh, we started up the aircraft and um, it checks itself once you've got all the engines running. And, um, we had a problem with the number two engine. Couldn't give us any anti-ice protection and because we were going to go oceanic over the Atlantic, um, we need to protect the engines from ice. And the engineers told us it was going to be three hours. They had to open up all the engine doors to get it fixed. A broken down aircraft means a delayed flight, which also means more work for Kerry Murphy-Brown and her flight logistics team, who now have to reorganise an entire flight plan. That was due out at 0700, because it is obviously going to be delayed getting down to MPA. Additionally to that, that firm will then be late to getting back to Bryce Norton, so for the next tasking, it has a knock-on effect. Every delay has kind of a domino effect. Whack, fail, whack, fail. We've hooked up a laptop with specialist diagnostic equipment. Hopefully we'll be, be able to diagnose which, which components are fault and rectify them. But there's a further setback. The laptop isn't working. First thing you do with your PC at home is, is probably turn it off and turn it back on again. We tried that, we checked all the cable connections. Um, no joy. The important egg delivery is grounded. And it's a bit of a shame, uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a crate full of eggs down the back. On a run like this, you take stuff down to the Falklands that they can't easily get hold of. Uh, eggs, tomato sauce here. Stuff that a small island like that doesn't manufacture or can't get easily. Me personally, I'd like to see that those eggs down in the Falklands on someone's breakfast plate. The task is delayed by 24 hours. 6672, 24 hour delay. It's a lot easier to do. Straight 24, same time and same bookings, but just 24 hours later. It just makes everything easy for the airfield stand route. A 24 hour gives them, them time to sort of get cracking on that, and hopefully by tomorrow, should be good to go. Um, hopefully, like, but um, you never know what's going to happen, do you? I'm fairly confident. If all the equipment works as it should, we'll, we'll get it done before 7 o'clock in the morning, no problem. Engineers, we always blame them if they can't fix the aircraft in time, and they tend to blame us if we break it. Twenty-four hours late, the C-17 is repaired and the 6,000 eggs and the rest of the cargo are on their way to the Falklands. I just find it funny that I, I, I'm now qualified to move £230 million aircraft uh, as a team leader and in charge of three and four guys. Yet if I try and reverse my dad's van into a parking space and try and help him out, he'll just completely ignore me because he knows best. Sergeant Mick Edmonds of Number One Air Mobility Wing is also about to take to the skies. He's about to leave the UK for a three-month deployment to Afghanistan. Now, though, it's all about spending as much time with his family as he can. Heavy, isn't it? How do you live? How do you live? Yeah, he's live. He's isn't it? That's where Dad puts his packed lunch in that bit, Nicole. <laughs> Sandwiches go in there. Yeah, you'll take that out. There you go. The sandwiches in. You've got a big plate there. Where's the plate It smells like cucumber. It smells like cucumber. I just want to sweat, my love. In Afghanistan, Mick will have an allowance of just 30 minutes of phone calls a week, and it's not always easy to get a connection. Thankfully, he's discovered that 45 second voice recordings, known as talking tins, can be posted to the front line. You're as mad as a box of frogs, and this battery's going to wear out any time before it gets near Afghanistan. You're as mad as a box of frogs, and this battery's going to wear out any time before it gets near Afghanistan. Thank you. 
I think what we need to do before we use this is actually write something down. Yeah. <laughs> it's always nice to receive gifts from uh, the girls. Uh, I'm sure they'll be sending me all sorts of boxes. Uh, I dread to think the sort of things Nicole will put in the box, uh, knowing her sense of humour. But uh, simple things like a packet of uh, cheese and onion crisps would be nice. And even though Mick's not leaving for a couple of days, Nicole already has her first box filled. And I've got a stress ball, in case Daddy gets a little bit stressy. And a little wash kit, a little pack of playing cards. And a pick that I drew. Uh, the last few days are not the toughest for us. I think the toughest days are when you find out you're going. The last few days are quite easy, really. Everything's ready to go. It's just a matter of actually getting up and going now. Because the, the sooner you get there, the sooner you can come back. With a 6.40 a.m. departure, Mick's at the terminal in the wee small hours, having said goodbye to his family at home. Yes, I do worry about him, but I also can't live worrying about him, because I would pull my hair out. Um, I have the opinion of, well, he could walk out the house tomorrow and get knocked off his bike on the way to work, and that is how He's at work, and that's how I have to have it in my head. He loves his job. He's happy to be going, which sounds a bit bizarre. He's wanted to go, so we can't stand in their way. We have to support them every way. Of course I miss him. You miss him loads. Yeah, you do. You miss him loads. Get on on your own. <laughs> Luckily, he comes back, so it's all right. <laughs>